You're listening to The Peach Pit. I'm here with Eric Thorfinson from the band Auto Catalytica. If you haven't checked these guys out yet, you haven't been listening to my show, obviously. So <laughs> you need to go back a couple of episodes. I'm really excited for their new release. Uh, this is like a totally unique sound coming from these guys. And to talk to the man himself who's uh, behind the helm of this, this is really, really exciting. So Eric, thanks for taking, taking, taking time to talk to me. And uh, welcome to The Pit. Absolutely. I'm happy to be here. Uh, I need to know your superhero origin story. So take me back. What was it like? Where did you grow up? Uh, so I grew up uh, like half an hour outside of Toronto uh, in a little town called Oakville. Um, yeah. And like, I guess I had a band in high school that was, you know, kind of a similar sound, but not as many disparate influences. Uh, they were called Ex Cathedra. And uh, I ended up getting accepted to Berkeley in Boston. So once I ended up going to school in Boston, that band kind of naturally fell apart. And I obviously still had more metal songs to write. So uh, I decided initially just to make like a solo project because I didn't have any band members. I was like, all right, I should should write some songs, get some demos going before I uh, try to convince anyone to hang out with me and play instruments. And uh, Auto Catalytica was born. That's how it happened. Okay, so I want to dig into this totally. Like, was guitar your first instrument? No, I actually started. I started playing piano when I was like four or five. Uh, it was obviously just horror at the beginning because no one wants to do anything their parents are telling them to do at that age. But uh, I was really glad I stuck with it. And then I guess my dad had had some kind of ill fated attempt to teach himself guitar at one point and uh, eventually just led to an acoustic guitar collecting dust in the basement. So I, uh, I was like nine years old and I found that guitar and I also like borrowed his Palm Pilot, if anyone is old enough to remember what a Palm Pilot is, uh, and like downloaded a Guitar Chords app and started teaching myself guitar at nine. And my parents found out and were like, yeah, you can have lessons, you know, <laughs> like, we'll, we'll get those for you now that you know how to do this. So that's how I started playing guitar, basically. So what, if you can try to remember uh, being inside your head back then, what was it that piqued your interest to actually like pick this thing up on your own and start teaching yourself chords? I think it was just, I had the idea that guitar is cool. I would like to be cool. So that was about it. I wish there was some more complicated answer than that, but it's definitely just wanting to be cool. And I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know how that wasn't actually going to translate to being cool. But, uh, you know, I, I'm still glad I did it, obviously. And getting into your early influences, how do you remember getting into heavier styles of music? I think I had a friend uh, when I was probably in like fourth or fifth grade back at, you know, when MP3 started being a thing and Napster was just beginning to exist. I think I even, the first MP3s I downloaded were before Napster. They were just on some like extra sketchy website. Um, but yeah, he had, he probably had an older brother that was into metal and that led me to downloading, uh, Metallica's kill Em all when I was like nine or something. And I was like, okay, this is cool. I have some aggression that I don't understand. <laughs> this resonates with me. So I think that was about the beginning. And then from there, I just kind of like trolled around on like CD baby or there was it like, it was before Amazon was really a thing for music. So I would just kind of like go on different forums and try to figure out what metal was. And uh, yeah, that's led me to where I am, more or less. And you start, you must have started getting into more experimental types of music before you left high school. I mean, eventually getting into Berkeley and everything. So were you already starting to listen to like jazz and everything? Or I think, yeah, like jazz. Um, I probably honestly, I got, my uncle was really into jazz and we were really tight so he he gave me a bunch of his jazz records kind of near the end of high school i was also into just like a lot of indie rock and other things just you know kind of anything that would be even loosely related to radiohead uh and that you know that variety of music i was also really into so it was never just i wasn't like a metal purist or anything but jazz and all that i, I was like super into jazz actually before i went to school and then i think i kind of got overdosed on jazz when i was learning about it all the time so I was kind of like, I, I like since have gotten way more into jazz again, but during school, I was not as into jazz. I don't think just because, you know, that was, that was work for me at that stage. And, and going to Berkeley, did you do two years or four years? Uh, I actually did like five years. I like, oh, wow. because I like, uh, I ended up just doing a lot of extra classes and the way it worked out was because I was an international student. You're not allowed to like take semesters off. 
or you're not allowed to take part-time semesters. And I didn't want to move home at all. So I just went like through the year for like, basically, you know, it was, I took a little semester off. I took like a year off actually, because I had a wrist injury right at the beginning. But uh, yeah, I, I basically just, it was like 10 semesters total, which equates to technically five years, more or less. So that's what I did. <laughs> and how would you, uh, what was that like for you going through that? Like coming out of school afterwards, did you kind of feel like you knew what you wanted to do? Because I feel like I, I've known lots of people who've taken music education and a lot of people when they get out of school, it's kind of like they sit down on their instrument and they can't jam or improvise anymore. They overthink everything that they do. Did you ever feel that way? Um, I felt that way sometimes, but, and I've also had a lot of friends that have been, have felt like that and you have been felt like they've been stifled by music education. Um, I think I, I didn't really feel like that. Like I was pretty hell bent on making auto catalytical work, especially right when I got out of school. Um, and I've, I mean, I always thought it was just so elucidating. Like I definitely had a, a kind of aha moment when it came to music theory growing up, I had nothing but annoyance with music theory, but there was a certain point near the end of Berkeley where I was just like, Oh, I get it. This all makes sense to me now. Um, and I just, it was really empowering. Like it gave me a bunch of, you know, it wasn't a cage. It was like, it was a way for me to express myself through, uh, you know, through different kind of paradigms. So that, that, yeah, I think that answers the question a little bit. It does. It does. Cause I think for a lot of people, yeah, once they start to dabble into the music theory, it starts to feel like a cage and like a prison because you think of everything as being rules, mm -hmm. but it's just really about perspective, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think I was just, I was lucky to have teachers who are not so much rule-based. They would use things always to explain music theory in context which was not always a thing. It's not, you know, it wasn't just you're following the rules or you're breaking the rules. It was how can we use these specific descriptors of a sound to give us more insight into what we're hearing as opposed to, you know, being restrictive. So I think that was a, an interesting way to go about it. Uh, so moving forward, uh, how did you meet Eric? Uh, we met through... A mutual okay yeah so the origin story of me meeting eric is actually really interesting the drummer who played on the most recent autocat record actually went to berkeley with me for my very first semester which was like summer 2008 and he was friends with eric um the, the drummer for this most recent record actually immediately he ended up not finishing berkeley but moving to uh to like right near my parents house in canada totally coincidentally but that's a different part of the story and uh, yeah, Eric and I were just like really fast friends. We had almost the exact same name and we're really into metal. And we had like hung out a couple times and I was starting to put together people for the band and doing auditions. And I remember there was one time he came over, we were playing guitar and we just like didn't even say anything. And he started playing the intro to this Opeth song. I think it was the Drapery Falls. And I just already knew it. And we just played through like most of the whole thing together. And we're like, oh, cool. <laughs> you know that song. And just like didn't even have to try at all. And then I was looking for other people. And then I was just like, wait, I should just ask Eric. And the rest is history. We're very, very compatible creators together after that. That's so crazy that you mentioned that song. I was actually just listening to that song this morning. Nice. <laughs> it's a great one. I love that track. <laughs> That's so crazy. And it must have been a pretty uh, serendipitous. Like you said, you almost have the exact same name, Eric Thorfinson, Eric Sorensen. So when you guys both sat down, it's like Eric and Eric, like let's yeah. make a band together. <laughs> yeah. It was really weird. Like I, it was all, by the time I had sent him the first message about that, it was just so obvious. He was like, yeah, I guess, I guess we could play songs. It's like, yeah. Obviously, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> and uh, you already kind of had a sound in, in, in mind for Autocatalytica? Yeah, I mean, as much as you can call whatever we do a consistent sound, I think I had, I had an idea of what I wanted. Um, but yeah, I mean, I had a couple songs kicking around. Like one of them, there's basically kind of like, there's there was a full Autocat album that existed that is kind of lost to the sands of time because I don't really want to release it. Uh, but it was all by myself. So one of those tracks I kind of, I wanted to rework for a live band. And so we kind of learned that together. He had some songs that he wrote too. And, uh, yeah. And then we started recruiting other members. It must've been really neat though. Like just finding that he had a style that kind of complemented your own. Totally. Totally. It was really, I mean, he, 
I don't usually like to subscribe to the, you know, the kind of traditional distinction between like rhythm guitar and lead guitar, because any band with two guitarists, they both have to do both. If they're, the band is any good, but he definitely was a much more like kind of expressively melodic player. than I was, and I definitely learned a lot from him. I kind of leaned towards rhythm a lot of the time. Um, but yeah, we definitely had complementary styles for sure. And uh, wh- wh- when you guys try to write, though, or w- when you write now, um, there must be a plethora of material that you come up with that does, doesn't does really fit into that vibe. So what do you do with it? Do you have another project that you kind of put other ideas into? Yeah, totally. I have, uh, I mean, I have, I've been releasing solo music for about as long as I've been doing anything metal as well. Um, so yeah, I do stuff with just myself, just under my name. Um, I've also got another a band project called Hosanna that uh, is with another friend of mine in Toronto. It's more kind of like dark ethereal indie rock, definitely not metal, but it's, you know, it's a little bit more palatable to the average listener. Um, so yeah, I like to have a lot of, a lot of different ways to express myself, but AutoCAD is very much the the metal vein of all that. Uh when you're writing for this music, uh, obviously now with the pandemic is a little bit of a different situation, but before this, did you guys like to get together and jam things out or did you find that you kind of write more independently? Yeah, it's weird. I mean, you know, especially with the the drummer being a different, you know, this is the first time I've worked with a different drummer than, uh, than the original drummer Emmett. Um, seeing as, you know, he lives in Brooklyn and I live in Toronto. So uh, yeah, like usually I'll kind of, I'll write a structure of a song um, in the early days, it was a lot more loose and improvised and jammy. And I'm, you know, a bit of a control freak. So I kind of, I get, I get a little bit frustrated with how long it can take to just jam things out exclusively for a feel. I'll generally now I'll kind of write an entire structure or make sure everything's transcribed. And then also do, uh, I'll write a drum part and basically have it transcribed just like kick and snare notation and then give it to whoever the, the, uh, the drummer is at the time. And then we'll just work through it together. And inevitably a bunch of things get changed. Cause we're like, Oh yeah, that doesn't feel good at all. And you're actually a drummer. So you know what much better to do there. So that's kind of the process for writing, but you know, a lot of things, uh, a lot of things get left and changed and you know, nothing is, nothing is totally said from the beginning. <laughs> I, I love the artwork that you use with that goes along with it. So this is you and one other person that makes it. Yeah. So like on my uh, on the previous record, Vicissitudes, uh, my girlfriend Rachel just did a, a piece like all the way from the beginning. She just you know I I gave her a, a very long heads up and uh, she made this amazing weird psychedelic gorilla melting thing, which is fantastic. Um, and then for this one, I was like, okay, yeah, I need some art. And I, I do a little bit of art myself, but I was like, okay, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll put something together, see what's up. And I started drawing something and I'm like in the same room as all of her awesome, awesome art. And I'm just like, yeah, this isn't going to be nearly as good <laughs> as her art. Like I gotta at least try to be consistent with the quality of the artwork for the record. So I also knew that like, I wasn't going to have enough time for her to put all the time that it takes into finishing the, the artwork as well as she can. So I basically was like, okay, I'm going to scan a bunch of her pieces that she has, stick them into Photoshop and kind of just mash them all together, see if I can make something that looks cool. And I think it uh, turned out all right. I, I think the, the artwork seems to just totally capture the visual representation of the music I mean, like yeah do, do you kind of do you have a word for that <laughs> <laughs> i don't know i mean other than the, the title of the record which was power clash of maximalism like i think that that actually also describes the art too which is just like hey let's put everything to full volume in this same weird cauldron of stuff and see what happens and that's kind of that's something that i you know that the whole approach to things i've also like I've been self-conscious about that being like, Oh, like, does this, is this the way music should be? Is like, you know, am I putting too many things in here? Does this song even make sense? And I was just, you know, with this record more just like, yeah, let's just do that. Let's just embrace it. And as opposed to, you know, trying to fight against it, just be like, yeah, this is, this is what I do. This is what it's called. And I uh, hope you like it. <laughs> so yeah, it was more the approach on this record. Well, and you brought in a lot of other artists too, collaborators to come and come in and help. Was that a, like a something that you wanted to do before you started it or is it part of the plan? Yeah, it was, I mean, honestly, a lot of it came from on, on vicissitudes. I did all of the mixing and all of the vocals completely by myself. So 
it was like really it just by the end of that mixing process and that was a much longer record was like 16 songs and it was just entirely like living in my parents basement at the time at, and just having to do all the vocals and think about if they're good or not it just got me into a not very healthy mental place where i just felt like i completely lost perspective on what was good so i didn't want to say okay i'm going to do no vocals on this record but i wanted to be able to have some other collaborators, especially vocally in there to just kind of like, Hey, let's see what's up. Let's like have some, have some people to bounce ideas off. Let's get some other voices on there. We can, you know, create a little bit more diverse palette and also, you know, save me the, uh, the mental anguish of being the only vocalist ever. <laughs> <laughs> so you mixed vicissitudes yourself? Yes. Yeah. I mixed all of vicissitudes as well as power clashing and, and the one before that too, but they get slightly better with each pro each release. I think. <laughs> I've only had uh, small uh, experiences with trying to mix recordings before. And I, I'm one of those people that when I listen to music, I can't help but like feel the emotion of the music. Mm -hmm. And I remember trying to mix a piece of mine that was really depressing. And after about four <laughs> hours of it, I had to turn it off because I felt like I'd been at a funeral. So I imagine trying to mix auto catalytica. Do you have to turn it off sometimes and like let your heart rate go down? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's definitely been times like that where I'm just, you know, like, Depending on how intense the song is, it's just like, okay, this really wears down on you. And just because, you know, there's just such dense harmonic content when it comes to metal that goes for any metal band you're mixing and not just us. Uh, it just, it fatigues on you a lot more mentally and just your ears. So for this record, basically, I gave myself like a maximum of two hours a day mixing, which is like, all right, I'm going to get up, do a little exercise. Uh, and then mix for two hours and then just not touch it again until the next day. Because then I, I also, you know, beyond being fatiguing to my uh, my body and soul, it was just like I wasn't necessarily making better mix decisions after those two hours. So it definitely kept me more sane, I think. Uh, is there any chance we'll see a music video? It's possible. It depends on uh, right now. It kind of depends on how the uh, the case spikes are going, just because right. it's a lot harder for you know me to get out and do something in in Toronto when you know we're having like Ontario had like seven hundred new cases yesterday. So it's really that is honestly the biggest stopper right now for having a music video or not. I think what would be perfect for you is an animated lyric video. Oh man. Yeah, that would be great. That would be, yeah. <laughs> that'd be really cool. I'd have to find a, a very intense, scary animator person to do that. Right. <laughs> so any animators listening to this, send Eric a message. <laughs> exactly. I'm always down for weirdness. So that'd be great. <laughs> Speaking of weirdness, your song titles. <laughs> Can, I mean, what, where do these, like I'm reading through the tracks and I'm like trying to, to like keep holding my laughter because it's like are you intentionally trying to get me to laugh or are you trying to like paint an image in my mind of what, like i actually see this thing like so i can't even say some of these things <laughs> some yeah. songs i can't play on the radio just because i know i can't say the name of the song yeah and it's it, like the, the titles themselves are usually more explicit than the lyrics even are because it's just like yeah this one's really crazy let's call it this some of them are not even they're not by me some of them were by Eric, um, especially on the last record. Some of them are literally just working titles where I'm just like, why would I want to change that? Like, you know, <laughs> like, I'm just like, yeah, this is not a real word. So it's not going to be a song that anyone else has. And like, and a lot of it is just kind of like, it's, it, it has to be like, not too blatant. Because generally, I like, I'll, I'll, I'll write a riff and I'll to try to remember what it sounds like when I, you know, just record a miniature demo of it. I'll title it something that is like what other band I think it sounds like or what other band's song I think it sounds like. So I'll just like have that in there. And then sometimes it's like, okay, the working title is literally too close to uh, to the actual band title from, and too obvious that I can't use it for the actual record. But a lot of the time it's not that obvious. So I can just, I can just put it on. <laughs> so uh, looking into the future, what do you see on the horizon for Autocatalytica? Yeah, it's, uh, man, everything is up in the air right now. It's, you know, especially with COVID and all that, uh, it's very difficult to, I mean, especially meet strangers in a recording space or rehearsal space. Uh, it's really hard to, you know, wrangle new people. I definitely be open to doing something in the future, but right now, I mean, the drummer on this past record, he got exported back to India, like the middle of last year. So he is not, it's not very easy to make 
a record between countries. Um, yeah, so I don't know. I'd be open to doing more stuff, but right now, uh, yeah, it's all it's all up in the air. I can, can we go into that for a second? What you just said about the so uh, I, I don't even know his name. Oh, so the drummer on this record was uh, his name's Neil Roy, and uh, yeah, so he was um, he was my roommate. Uh, or, or I met him first semester of Berkeley in Boston. He uh, wasn't able to finish Berkeley. He actually moved back home. He was living in Oman at the time. Moved back home to Oman and then moved to Mississauga, just outside of Toronto, uh, and happened to be in a recording program there. Which in he you know he lived less than ten minutes from my parents' house, so I would like see him when I would go visit Canada while I was in the states. And uh, eventually, I moved back to Canada in 2015. He was like, "Hey, we should uh, make a band thing." And I was like, "All right, let's uh, let's do some AutoCAD. I want to make another record." And yeah, that's uh, that's about it. But he, so he yeah, he just had a visa that expired. He wasn't able to get it renewed. So he uh, he moved back to India uh, last year in the middle of the year. All right. Well, shout shout out to him. Yeah, because <laughs> he nailed it. I mean, yeah. that's one of the things I love listening about it. It's one of those records where it sounds like it was played by human beings. Like you can actually hear the struggle. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and there was plenty of struggle. I'm sure you can hear. Well, you're obviously uh, reaching for the stars. Uh, I need to ask, because it's kind of a staple question. Hmm. What advice would you give to anyone who's just trying to pursue their dreams? Yeah, I would say that uh, I kind of have gone back and forth on this, but uh, for a very technical thing, spend as much money as you possibly can on the recording. You're never going to regret spending a lot of money on a record. <laughs> Uh, that is one thing I just, you know, I, now I have a little bit more money than I did back in the day, but like, I, you know, I wasn't ever just able to spend as much as I wanted to on a record. And I, that's kind of why I did a lot of it myself. But yeah, if you got the money, it's never going to be wasted. You're never going to be like, oh, this record sounds, sounds too good. I wish I hadn't spent any money on it. Um, do that. And then on a more just kind of creative thing, just always like, don't, don't take into account how other people are going to perceive your sound that doesn't lead to good results for anyone if you like it that's got to be the ultimate test there's something to the you know to the concept of authenticity which is just just do the things that move you especially when it comes to being creative obviously it doesn't that doesn't apply to like how to be nice to people and be a human in the world but when it when applied to creativity like you got to move yourself first or no one else is going to follow and it's okay if people don't get it just you know make sure you're happy in the, in the first place authenticity everyone eric thor thorfinson himself putting yeah. out wise advice uh is there anything else you'd like to say to our listeners i think that's about it i just hope uh, everyone checks out the record and is uh confused scared and a little bit happy about it <laughs> that's that's a great way of putting it eh? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that how, how do you imagine like the the feeling like that you tried to capture if you could capture uh, an essence of a word Does, is it just autocatalytica yeah pretty much i mean in the, the record titled power clashing maximalism i had a, a friend of mine uh, back in the day say just it sounds like i'm just moving really really fast through a bunch of disparate landscapes but it's a lot of fun i'm like yeah that, that's a good feeling <laughs> i like that <laughs> <laughs> oh wow everyone eric thorfinson from the band autocatalytica check out their new album power i can't even say it power <laughs> maximalism power clashing maximalism yeah. <laughs> you're just trying to make my job hard on purpose absolutely <laughs> check out autocatalytica everybody eric thanks for taking time to talk to me no problem Glad to be here. <laughs> all right take care everybody <laughs>